to talk about capillary electrophoresis method and how it can solve many analytical tasks in the beverages industry. Uh, this is actually uh, stated in the title of my presentation, how to get inside the wine and spirits, fast and reliable chemical analysis. The content of this presentation. First, I will shortly introduce our company Lumex Instruments. Then I would like to underline some basic features of capillary electrophoresis as a method which was realized on our C instruments, which we offer today uh, in the webinar. Then we will talk about the recommendations of International Vine and Wine Organization, or shortly its abbreviation is OIV. And finally, we will discuss in all details the most important analytical protocols to be used in the beverages industry, which were developed in Lumex analytical centers and are realized on our CE instruments. These protocols you can see on the slide. The most important of them are stated here. This is the determination of inorganic anions, K ions, M ions, determination of organic acids, determination of sugars, and determination of aromatic aldehydes. But let me first introduce our company. Lumex Instruments is worldwide known as a company which manufactures analytical instruments and develops uh, the necessary analytical protocols to be realized on them. Our headquarters are located in Vancouver, Canada and in St. Petersburg, Russia. We have important sales and research offices in Hamburg, Germany, it's our main European office, and in Beijing, China. So about 350 highly skilled uh, employees are working in Lumex worldwide. We export our products in more than 80 countries. On this map, you can see these countries which are colored in blue. So this was indeed a very short introduction <laughs> to our company. So let's come now to the point. The next slide uh, is very important to understand our marketing strategy. Actually, there are two different groups of, uh, I would say, potential customers to which we offer, to whom we offer our products. The first group is scientists, researchers working in different research centers. For them, we offer our sophisticated capillary electrophoresis or simply C system couple 105M in which capillary electrophoresis method as a method is realized. Uh, these people can use the instrument for scientific investigations, method development. They can publish results in different scientific journals or present them on symposiums on this topic. Because the CE method has been a subject of science since more than 35 years. I'm always laughing that even if the instrument will be completely damaged, you can still use it as a thermometer because it's one of the most robust units in the instrument. But seriously speaking, this is a very sophisticated instrument which we are proud to have for the market and to offer to our potential customers. Another group of potential customers is analysts working routinely every day with different types of analysis in different analytical labs worldwide. They need not just an instrument, but rather they need the complete solution of their analytical tasks. For such customers, we offer the very well-developed analytical methods, or I would better say protocols, analytical protocols for the determination of this or that group of compounds, which are realized on couple CE system. These protocols are composed in form of standard operation protocols, so-called SOP, which means they can be internally or externally validated in each accredited lab according to international standard ISO 17025, as it has already happened in the labs of many of our customers worldwide. So these two groups of our potential customers are uh, the most uh, the scientists, researchers, and analysts to whom we offer our products. On the next slide, this is for the first time I demonstrated to you the photo of our CE system couple 1 of IM. It's on the right side and on the left side 
you see the complete list of different application cells where our systems can be used. From pharmacology to the very complicated biotech research, including even affinity studies having moon analysis. The application of the food industry is highlighted in red because, as you know today, it is the main point of our presentation. Very shortly, let me speak about the general scheme of any device in which capillary electrophoresis is hidden. Um, for example, here you see such a scheme. It's a very simple. At the heart of any CE device, there is a capillary. Very narrow capillary made from fused silica. Its diameter about normally 50 micrometers or 75 micrometers. Uh, it is being cooled or better said thermostated. So the temperature of the capillary is always constant. The capillary is filled just with buffer. There is no any solid packing material inside it. It's a normal buffer which can be any kind of buffer like borate buffer, phosphate, citrate or whatever. At the beginning, you inject your sample solution in the inlet end of the capillary using the very highly accurate and very highly precise pressure unit, very highly controlled pressure unit. We are talking about 2 to 10 nanoliter solution of the sample, not more. After the sample is injected, you immerse the inlet end of the capillary back in the buffer vial, and finally you apply high voltage. Components of your complex mixture, of your sample mixture, which were injected in the capillary, are charged and therefore they start moving along the capillary towards the detector point and towards the outlet of the capillary. But they have different structures, these components have different structure and they are charged differently. Therefore, they move with different velocities and which means, as a result, they reach the detector point at different times. So at the end of the run, you normally have a sequence of peak where each peak theoretically represents the pure component and the peak area or peak cage is directly proportional to the initial concentration of this component in your sample mixture. This is a very simple description of how it works. So generally, this is a separation technique, and the separation is due to the differences in charge to mass ratio of the injected components. Uh, there is another phenomenon in capillary electrophoresis, which is very important, and which I would like to describe in a very uh, short way without going deeply into details. It is called electrosmotic flow. Because of the structure of fused silica, the inner surface of the capillary is being negatively charged when the most of buffers are inside the capillary, when the pH of the buffer is higher than, let's say, 3 to 4. Because of this negative charge, there is a layer of positively charged components inside the capillary near the surface. And when you apply the high voltage, this lawyer of high density lawyer starts moving towards the negative pole which is on the right side of the slide and this bulk flow of the liquid is so strong that it forces to move not only positively charged cations or neutral charged components but also negatively charged components will be also moved towards a negative pole despite of the fact that they are negatively charged. This is because of the very strong bulk flow of the liquid inside the capillary. And as a result of this phenomenon, which is called electrosmotic flow, both anions and cations can be analyzed in one run. This is the most important difference from the standard slab gel electrophoresis, where you can analyze only uh, positively or only negatively charged composed in one run. 
let us make a small conclusion. So, what are the important features of capillary electrophoresis as a method? First of all, separation occurs under the influence of the applied electric field. There is a phenomenon which is called electrosmotic flow. It gives rise to very high peak efficiencies, sometimes up to millions of theoretical plates, and there is no pumps because it is electrosmotic flow. This is the contrary to any kind of chromatography systems where you need pumps. Absence of packed material. As I mentioned, inside the capillary is only electrolyte buffer, so we do not have such unpleasant things like unspecific binding to the packed material. There is no problems of aging of the packed material, which we often see working with the chromatography. And finally, you get information about multiple components. So this is a typical separation technique, and you get the information about all components which were injected and which were present in your sample. This gives rise to other features of capillary electrophoresis, which I would like to underline as main advantages. First of all, this is the highest flexibility in method development. So many applications can be realized on one instrument. And here we have another advantage, which is closely related to the first one, easiness in switching between different protocols, which uh, explain the universality of the system. For example, you would like to work in the morning with a protocol for the analysis of organic acids. You use one capillary, which is packed in a specially capillary cassette. Afternoon, you wish to switch to another protocol, for example, for the determination of inorganic anions. What you need is just to withdraw the first cassette from the instrument and to put inside the second cassette to condition the capillary and then you can proceed with another protocol. So, altogether, to exchange the cassettes, you need several seconds, and then to condition the capillary, you need another two to five minutes. After this time, you can immediately start working with another protocol. This is what we call universality in the using of the instrument. So one instrument can be used for many protocols, provided each protocol is realized on the separate capillary cassette. Simplicity in instrument design. We do not have any expensive columns we do not have any precise pumps, nothing. This is the reason why we have low initial price for the instrument. And finally, last but definitely not least, we have very low region consumption. It's up to six milliliters per day, even if you work eight hours per day. So all these things mean that we have very low analysis cost, finally. And on the next slide, you can compare the roughly investments in C versus any kind of chromatography system. In this case, it's HPLC. Uh, in, initial investments are quite uh, moderate, uh, definitely less than HPLC. You do not have accessories because the only accessory is a capillary. And the 10 meters of capillary, which is definitely enough for whole of your life, uh, will cost about $100 uh, and which is uncomparable with the price of HPLC columns. Okay, it's waste. The waste is the most important thing. Uh, if you work 21 working day per month, you get at the end about 60 to 70 milliliters, which is uncomparable with s several liters of the standard waste amount of HPLC. So all this stuff brings to the point that the and now this cost is very low. Now let me go directly to the point of the tasks in beverages industry and how capillary electrophoresis can help solving these tasks. What are the actual tasks in the modern beverages industry? First of all, it's the safety and quality control of raw materials and final products. Next is the confirmation of authenticity or falsification. It's a huge 
problem. It's one of the most important problems worldwide. The tons of falsified products, wines, spirits, cognacs, brandy, whiskies, the tons of them are actually can be found in each supermarket, by the way. And capillary electrolysis cannot solve completely this problem, but it can help a lot in order to at least to understand that this or that product could be falsified. And we will talk about the examples how this can be done. The next task in industry is quality control of water used for beverages production. Please do not forget that the water is a predominant product with predominant product in such uh, beverages like cognac, brandy, whiskey, uh, beer or whatever, liquors. So the water must be prepared before making the final product, making the final mixture. And the water must be controlled as well. Finally, it's technological control of beverages production. It's always cheaper and more clever to have many points in technological chain, manufacturing chain, where you control the the manufacturing of certain beverages than to have only quality control department at the end. So these are the most important tasks in the modern industry. Most probably all of you know the existence of such a very famous and very renowned uh, organization, which is International Organization of Vine and Wine. Uh, abbreviation is OIV. There are recommendations of this organization uh, dealing with the capillary electrophoresis. First of all, and the most important, OIV has officially accepted CE as a method of analysis in analogy. And the following protocols are officially recommended by V. These protocols are realized based on the capillary electrophoresis method. So they are determination of organic acids together with sulfates, determination of sorbic acid, and determination of lysosine. But together with OIV protocols and OIV recommendations, our company Lumex Instrument has developed our own protocols to be used in analogy and generally in beverages industry. All these protocols are based on capillary electrophoresis and they are realized on our Capel 105M capillary electrophoresis system. These protocols are determination of inorganic cations and amines together in one run, determination of inorganic anions, determination of organic acids, determination of sugars, and determination of aromatic aldehydes in cognac, brandy, and whiskey. Actually, we have more protocols, but these are the most popular protocols which we offer our customers worldwide working in analogy or in spirit industry. Let us talk in depth about each of the protocols. First, it's determination of inorganic cations. If we talk about the determination of these cations in wines, brandies, and vodkas, the following things must be considered. These Determination, this protocol serves as a quality control for the final products. It definitely helps in recommendations for storage and transportation. It can detect deviations in water preparation. And finally, it identifies falsification. I will show you some of the most interesting examples. But before, let me talk about the general considerations about the k times in wines. If the amount of potassium or calcium is too high in the wine, the wine can become feclent. If the amount of potassium is low, the wine is definitely falsified because potassium's concentration in grape juice is much higher than the concentration of potassium in any kind of tap water, which sometimes is used to falsify, to dilute the product. So if you get the potassium concentration low the certain limit, it is definitely uh, the case that the product is falsified, it is not the wine. 
here we have this ketone protocol for wine and here how it looks like. This is a standard, a very typical electrophorogram we call it results of capillary electrophoresis run, but called electrophorogram. So this is a standard electrophorogram of red wine, which was just one to five times diluted, filtrated and injected. There is no any special sample pretreatment. Dilution, filtration and injection. What we can see here, we, ha we see four predominant ketones, potassium, sodium, magnesium and calcium. Each can be quantified, of course, based on the calibrations. But besides, we also see some important amino acids, which are lysine, arginine, and histidine. And this is not all. Simultaneously, in one run, we can quantify several important amines, including very important histamine, which is a, which is a product of highest allogenicity. So, not only ketones, but also amines and certain, or certain amino acids can be quantified using our ketone protocols for wine. These are another examples of the analysis of wines using our ketones protocol. On the upper trace, you, hear, you see the analysis of the red dry wine cabernet. And the concentration of potassium, which is here higher than one gram per liter, is highlighted in red. If you look on the bottom trace, the concentration of potassium is about 15 times less. And this brought us to the proposal, to the point that most probably this was not the real semi-sweet wine muscat, but just a kind of falsification. The further investigation, the further experiments showed us unequivocally that this is indeed completely falsificated product. So this is how capillary electrophoresis can help in such an important task as identification of falsification. Another two examples, brandies and vodka, how these protocols can be used in the production of brandies, cognac and vodka. If the amount of sodium is too high, water cartridge must be exchanged. As I mentioned before, water must be prepared before making the final mixture product. Normally, the preparation is done by passing the water for the water cartridge based on the ion exchange process. But sometimes, if the cartridge is damaged, or the cartridge is too old, or because of any other reasons, the process can be converted vice versa. Instead of taking the necessary ketones out from the water, other ketones will be put back to the water. And this must be definitely controlled because you can spoil the whole product. For cognac and brandy, if the amount of calcium is higher than 3 mg per liter, cognac can become turbid especially if oxalic acid is present. And I will show you later how it, is, how it could be dangerous if this combination is present in cognac, oxalic acid together with a high concentration of calcium. But even if there is no oxalic acid in cognac, the concentration of calcium higher than 3 mg per liter brings the product to become turbid and feculent and there will be precipitation. So, this parameter, calcium concentration, must be precisely controlled. On the next slide, you see two examples of brandy analysis using our k times protocol. On the top trace, on the upper trace, you see the concentration of potassium and calcium, which are much lower than these concentrations on the bottom trace. And based on the conclusions which I made before on the previous slide, further investigations showed us that the product which we analyzed on the bottom trace uh, had a tendency to precipitate after even a short storage. This is because of the very high concentration of these two 
company at least two gay times. And other examples show us the analysis of vodka and how it's important to control the water cartridge and the water passing through this cartridge. If you look on the bottom trace, the concentration of sodium is about one milligram per liter. On the upper trace, the concentration of sodium is about 30 times higher. And this is definitely the deviation of water treatment. The cartridge must be exchanged, the water must be definitely exchanged, otherwise the final product will be completely spoiled. On the next slide, we shortly talk, uh, let's say we shortly summarize how the protocol for inorganic anions and cations determination can be generally used for the water analysis. It's the determination of anions and cations in any kind of drinking water. It's determination of anions and cations in water used for the manufacture of beverages. And finally, it's analysis of soil. It might be very important for people working in vineyards uh, in order to understand whether this certain uh, grape or vine can be grown on this certain soil. These are two typical examples of the analysis of calibrated mixture for inorganic cations and inorganic anions. These two protocols which we offer to our customers has been so popular in the last 10 years that in several countries these protocols are already the national standards. On the upper trace you see the separation of nine inorganic cations from ammonium to calcium and on the lower trace you see the separation of six most important inorganic anions from chloride to phosphate. By the way, uh, on the bottom trace, on the low trace, you can also analyze simultaneously bromide together with all these inorganic anions. Standard uh, examples of how this can be used in the analysis of real samples, for example, tap water from Switzerland or mineral water from Henias, all these anions from chloride to sulfate to nitrate to fluoride and finally phosphate can be easily quantified. This is another uh, example for the analysis of soil. The same protocol can be used to determine, to quantify inorganic anions in any kind of soil. In this certain example, this is just a water extract from one of the soil type named Chernozem. And what is indeed interesting, not only inorganic anions, but also some important organic acids like oxalate, formate, and acetate can be quantified in one run simultaneously together with uh, inorganic anions. Another examples uh, show you how our protocol for the determination of inorganic cations can be used in water samples. Any kind of water, surface water, tap water, bottle water, Natural water can be analyzed for the presence of certain inorganic cations. What is interesting here, for example, is the presence of high concentration of strontium. This tap water originates from Argentina, from the uh, parts of Argentina located near the mountains, and this is because of the volcanic activities uh, of the mountains. So sometimes we can find very high concentration of strontium and such water. Another protocol is determination of organic acids in wine and spirits. This protocol was certified recently by French Accreditation Commission COFRAC and is the most popular protocol within our European customers working in analogy. Why actually do we need to know the information about uh, concentration of organic acids in wine, wine materials, must uh, or spirits. To answer many questions, what is the quality of grape and grape must? How is the initial alcoholic fermentation progressing? Should we start the malolactic fermentation and at which time? How is this fermentation progressing? Should we reserve this certain batch? Should we make the grain reserve from this batch or should we use it to produce the 
cheapest young wine and thousands of other questions. All these questions can be addressed and these questions can be answered hopefully with our protocol for the determination of organic acids in wine spirits. Standard acids can be determined at first. They are six standard, so-called standard organic acids, succinic, malic, tartaric, citric, acetic, lactic. You can almost always find them in any wine sample. But together, in one run, also extended number of acids can be found and quantified. Oxalic, formic, fumaric, propionic, gluconic, sorbic, benzoic, and even ascorbic acids. All these acids can be quantified within one run in your samples. Here are also stated some recommended average values, but please be aware of the fact that in different regions, even within one country, these recommendations are different. But nevertheless, they exist, and our protocol for the organic acid determination helps you to understand whether you are within the range of recommendation values or out of them. This is a very typical example of how the protocol works. Analysis of Argentinian white dry wine. Six so-called standard organic acids, which you can always see in most of cases in wines, can be easily quantified. They are succinic, malic, tartaric, citric, aesthetic, and lactic. The whole analysis it is about seven minutes, and within seven minutes you get all this information. In this slide, this is interesting, the presence of malic acid, it is highlighted in the green circle, because malolactic fermentation normally results in the disappearance of malic acid and the increasing concentration of lactic acid. On the next slide, you see the analysis of uh, old Argentinian red wine Malbec and you see that here the malolactic fermentation was completed because we do not have any peak of malic acid and instead we have a huge peak of lactic acid at the end of the separation. Once again I would like to draw your attention the whole analysis you get within seven minutes. This is another example. It's a European red wine which was stored in improper conditions. Why do we say that the conditions were improper? Because of two very interesting and very strange things. First of all, we have the presence of formic acid. It shouldn't be normally present in natural wines. Here, the additional investigations showed us that the formic acid originated from the plastic bottles and plastic barrels in which this wine was kept for a certain time. Another strange thing is the presence of propionic acid. The propionic acid clearly indicates that there was a microbial contamination in this certain wine, probably from the very beginning when it was a must. But there is a contamination and it means that to a certain extent this wine is spoiled and it's better not to use it at least as a expensive maturated wine. And this brings me to the point of the universality of the information which I get from capillary electrophoresis analysis. And this is the main difference from the enzymatic analyzer. When I use enzymatic analyzer for the determination of organic acids, I normally insert a certain kit for the certain organic acid which I would like to quantify. If I, if I do not expect the presence of the formic acid or the presence of the propionic acid in this certain sample, I would never put in the machine these kits because the kits are very expensive. Here, in contrary, in the capital electrophoresis, in our protocol, you get in one run complete information about all organic acids present in your sample. Doesn't matter whether you want to get this information or not, you get it 
and then it is up to you to decide how to proceed further with this information, what to do with the knowledge that there is a formic acid or there is a propionic acid. But at least you know that there are certain organic acids which shouldn't be present in this wine. And this, to my mind, is a very big advantage of this method compared with, for example, with the uh, enzymatic analyzers used in this field. But organic acids can be found and quantified not only in wine and wine materials, but also in other products like, for example, brandy, cognac, whiskey, liquor, or something like, something like this. If we talk about distillated products like cognac, brandy, normally only acetic acid should be present because it's volatile and it gives rise to the volatile acidity. Rarely lactic acid is also found as a result of ethyl lactate degradation because this ether, ethyl lactate, can be distilled. And some other acids can be but should not be present because of any deviations in manufacture. And actually, the next example shows you, shows you the very interesting analysis of old cognac. Here, there are several things which definitely attract the attention of any analyst. First of all, this is the presence of tartaric acid. Cognac is a distillation product, so there should not be any tartaric acid in it. Nevertheless, it was. Here, we quantify it. Uh, the explanation comes after, the explanation has come after very careful consideration of the history of this cognac. This cognac is very old and it was stored in a org barrels which had been used before for the wine storage. Now it's forbidden in the cognac industry, but before it was allowed. So this is the reason why we get the tartaric acid peak for the in analysis in this cognac. Another strange thing is the presence of oxalic acid. You might remember that before I mentioned already how it's important to know the presence of oxalic acid and calcium ions in cognac. This oxalic acid originated from Boise. Boise is an orc uh, extract and this was definitely the deviation of technology because oxalic acid in cognac, being already in cognac, reacts with calcium cations making precipitation. And at the beginning, when we started analyzing this cognac, it was already turbid, it was already feculent, and it was a big disaster for the cognac producer. So this is again brings me to the point how it's important to know in advance all these parameters like organic acids or K times in your products. You can avoid a lot of very unpleasant things uh, like losing most of your product. Next example shows you the very strange analysis. Originally it was called a wine and the very routine analysis which determines the total acidity demonstrated that it's, everything is okay with this product. The total acidity was at the standard acceptable level, higher than 5 grams per liter. But the detailed analysis with our organic acid protocol demonstrated that it's just a falsification and nothing else. Only three organic acids were found together with sorbic acid, which shouldn't be present here, and it became absolutely clear that there was just a mixture of some uh, bad manufacturers, let's say, bad manufacturers, the mixture of three organic acids, and that's all. This is again the example how these protocols help you to identify falsification. Organic acids can be determined not only in wine or spirits, but also, of course, in beer, like succinic acid, citric acid, 
Acetic acid and lactic acid can be almost always found in any kind of beer and easily quantified within the same protocol. Now we come to another protocol which is called determination of aromatic aldehydes in cognac brandies and whiskey. And aromatic aldehydes can also serve as authentication criteria. These aldehydes are coniferaldehyde, cyanopaldehyde, cyrinaldehyde, and vanillin. Very interesting to notice that this ratio between cyrinaldehyde and vanillin is always between 2.5 to 1 to 4 to 1. And the major component should be always cyrinaldehyde and not anything else. Also, the presence of other acids like phenol carboxylic acids can be found. Here you see the typical example of the analysis of a very renowned cognac creamy matan, 1 to 10 diluted. Once again, there is no any special sample pretreatment for our protocols. It is just dilution, filtration, and injection. Here we have all four peaks of all four aldehydes, with the sarin aldehyde being predominant product, and the ratio between it and vanillin is 2.8 to 1, which is fully accepted. Sarin aldehydes, as you see, and vanillin, two important peaks. On the next example, you see also the analysis of very famous renowned cognac Hennessy which was 1 to 10 diluted, and here you see the same four peaks and sarinaldehyde being predominant product and vanillin and the ratio between sarinaldehyde and vanillin is about 2.8 to 1. So, in a full acceptable range. Next, separation. Shows us something totally different. Again, we see four peaks. But now the predominant product is not the sarinaldehyde, but vanillin. And the ratio between sarinaldehyde and vanillin is just 0 0.0521, which is far out from the recommended range. Further investigations showed us that this product was completely falsified product. It wasn't a brandy, it wasn't a cognac, it was just a falsificated mixture of something. And it can be met very often, unfortunately. How people use to make this falsification? They take a little bit of brandy, they dilute it with ethanol water mixture, and in order to make the special noise, they put a lot of vanillin inside because vanillin is a very cheap product. Thus, you get this very characteristic distribution between four peaks when we have vanillin as an absolute predominant peak. Such electrophorogram should tell you immediately that this is falsification. Another product. And another protocol which we have is determination of sugars in wine, spirits, and other products. Basic sugars in the protocol can be quantified. These are fructose, glucose, and sucrose. But also, together in one run, extended numbers of sugars can be also determined, like xylose, maltose, and lactose, and arabinose. Different products can be analyzed, not only wine, spirit, for example, honey, liquor, jams, yogurts, and so on. Everything can be done. Here we get the typical examples of such analysis. This was dry wine, cabernet. We have two pieces of glucose and of fructose and glucose. In another example, we have analysis of brandy. It is quite old brandy. Initially, there was sucrose but it was completely converted into fructose and glucose during storage, so now we have only these two peaks. No any traces of saccharose could be detected. In the next example, we have extended numbers of sugars, which could be quantified. 
This is a young brandy, and we have a huge peak of sucrose, which is slowly inverting into fructose and glucose, but we also have xylose and arabinose. Here, finally, we are coming to the certain conclusions. First of all, important economical considerations. We have very low sample consumption. Normally, what is injected is less than 10 nanoliters. So, for people working in the analogy or in the spirit and the beverages industry, probably this is not very important because they produce their products in a decaliters. But for analysts working in high-tech biotechnology research, this could be very important because the sample solution can be extremely expensive. After the injection, you can use this solution for any further investigations. Another advantage of capillolytic is very short analysis time. Typically, it is four to six minutes. Uh, very low region consumption must be also underlined. Normally, it is uh, free, I would say, six milliliters per day maximum if you work eight hours per day, which is nothing definitely compared with the uh, rates after HPLC usage. And all these things bring us to the most important conclusion that we have very low analysis cost. Here I have the very last slide, uh, and I think that everything which I presented today uh, permit, permits me to conclude that the unique combination of the sophisticated instrument, Capel 105M, which, in which capillary electrophoresis method is realized, and very well-developed analytical protocols, most of them are certified, this combination could be the very right choice for you, for people, for the analysts working in the beverages industry. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, now I'm ready to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, it's time for the Q&A, and I'd like to remind our viewers that you can continue to submit questions at any time during the Q&A using the box on your screen. We'll get the questions as we can. First question, how is it possible, Madam, to use so many analytical protocols on one instrument? Please explain this in more detail. Yeah, this question I can hear quite often because it's indeed uh, at the beginning people probably do not believe whether it is possible to combine so many protocols in one instrument. Uh, in reality, it, it is already done. It is very easy. The point is that the separation occurs within the capillary and the capillary is packed inside the specially designed capillary cassette. This is done in order to exchange capillaries easily. Normally, for each protocol, you reserve one capillary. So, for example, you work at the beginning of the day with the analysis of inorganic cations. Uh, then you need to switch to another protocol, for example, for the organic acid determination. What you need is to withdraw the capillary acid, which was used for, N for cations, and to insert another cassette, which was reserved before and was lying somewhere on the bench. After this, you need to change the solutions in your outer sampler, and that's all. What you need uh, further probably is to load the special electronic files because all our protocols are being supplied together with certain electronically saved files. And these files contain the complete information about the measurement program which we need to use for this certain protocol, and about the auto sampler configuration. So you open these files, you put your new solutions inside the auto sampler, and then you start, and then you press the start button in order to run the next protocol. Altogether, it takes you about five minutes, and to change, to exchange the cassettes, uh, you need just several seconds. That's all. 
Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> our next question is, are the samples injected with meat, or are they diluted or otherwise prepared? And what are typical, and follow up to that is, what are typical analytical concentrations for linear con quantitation? Yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, I would like to underline that samples are injected just after dilution. Normally, for each protocol, we have our recommendations. What is the dilution factor? For example, to analyze organic acids in wines, you need to dilute your samples by about 25 times. To, uh, anal to analyze cations in wines, you need to dilute these samples about 20 times. After you dilute it, normally you dilute it with distilled water, so after you dilute it, you filtrate it through a membrane type filter, any kind of membrane type filter is okay. And after this, you inject it. That's all. There is no any chemical pretreatment or any other kinds of physical pretreatment of your samples. Okay, very, uh, very good, thanks. The next question is, do you see interference from other ions and other sugars when you are measuring acids? No, I do not see any interference, absolutely. Uh, if we talk about the analysis of organic acids, at the very, very beginning, if you look at this slide, you can see a small peak. At this peak are actually uh, several anions together, like chloride, normal, and sulfate. They do not interfere in any way the measurement of organic acids as well as sugars. Uh, the presence of sugars do, the presence of sugars does not interfere the measurement of organic acids. Very good. Um, <clears throat> next question is wines and beers contain particulates and sediments that often increases the product's age. What is the relation between such particulates and C E determined on lights? Does it does the aging affect the CE analysis? The aging of the wines affect the CE analysis only in terms of the presence of certain components which uh, can be higher or lower in different wines with different aging. Uh, if there are some precipitates, of course, these particles should not be injected in the capillary. In order to prevent injection of any kind of solid particles, as I mentioned, you need to filter your samples before the injection. Normally, you do it with a membrane-type filter, and it takes about several seconds. But uh, it is absolutely true that the aging affect the analysis by the presence, for example, of the huge peak of lactic acids instead of malic acid after the malolactic fermentation has been completed or if we uh, talk about the analysis of cognacs and brandy, uh, the concentration of aromatic aldehydes will be higher if the cognac is uh, quite old. So this is how it uh, affects the analysis. Very good. Um, <clears throat> next question is, is there a means for individual compound or separated peak collection for potential identification? Uh, it's a complicated question. Um, actually, there is no such means because um, normally there should be several peaks and if you see these peaks all together in a certain ratio, you can say, for example, that this is, uh, let's say, Malbec, Argentinian Malbec, or it is uh, uh, any other kind of uh, grape sort or grape type. Actually, it is very hard to do such correlation. People in the research departments, in the analogical departments of the university, they do such job. And I read many articles about how they manage to find these correlations between the presence of certain peaks, for example, of organic acids being in a certain ratio to each other. And uh, the fact that this comes from the certain wine sort. But uh, it is a very special job and it must be done carefully in each case. Thank you. 
that in, in your presentation, you mentioned kits, analysis kits. But what does each contain? How much time do you need to start working with a new protocol using a kit? Mm -hmm. uh, for each protocol, we have developed uh, certain kits. For example, the protocol for the determination of organic acids, we have organic acids chemical kit. It contains, first of all, the bottles with so-called intermediate solutions. And it contains also the small flask with standards, already mixed standard solution. Together, it comes with a certain text on the paper format, but also it can be uh, purchased, of course, as an electronic file. So in this text, it is completely and in all details dated how you should use these intermediate solutions in order to prepare the final buffer solution. You mix, for example, 2 milliliters of solution A plus 1 milliliter of solution B plus 3 milliliters of water, and that's all. Besides, uh, in the text it is clearly stated which capillary electric conditions must be specified in order to run this certain analysis. Um, the text is written in the form of SLP, Standard Operation Protocol, and could be easily internally or externally validated. Uh, actually, this was done many times already by our 